Hello everyone, welcome to the Lightning Ball channel. If you haven't yet subscribed to my videos, please do so and activate the notification bell. Your support fuels my continued efforts. In our last episode, we discussed how the Eastern Empire dispatched three otherworldly beings to the Monster Federation to investigate the underground labyrinth. Unfortunately, they were unable to defeat Adelman's team, the White King who guarded the 60th floor and returned to therein to embark on new espionage activities. Meanwhile, upon learning about Ramura's true capabilities, the great mage Gadra decided to personally visit the Monster Federation with those three otherworldly beings and revealed the Empire's intentions. In this episode, we will delve into the Ten Guardians of the Labyrinth and the Imperial Court meeting of the Eastern Empire. Let's get started. Gadra was received in a rather ordinary reception room. After brief introductions, Gadra began sharing his story. A reincarnated being, Gadra sought the pinnacle of great magic. Using secret techniques, he extended his life for a millennium, devouring precious books from various royal collections. During those tedious days, Gadra formed a close bond with Adelman. Upon learning of Adelman's tragic demise in a foreign land, Gadra spent centuries devising a plan inciting the Eastern Empire to attack the Western countries. Rimuru, listening intently, realized that it seemed Gadra was the puppet master behind the Empire's war ambitions. However, the real reasons for the war involved Gi and Emperor Rudra's game, which we'll address in the next episode. Noticing a change in Rimuru's expression, Gadra hurriedly explained that, despite his reasons, he had always opposed the Empire's attack on the Jura Forest. After all, with the presence of the storm dragon Veldora, Gadra had no wish to repeat the disaster of 350 years ago. Hence, he suggested the Empire ally with the armed nation of Dwargan, allowing military passage. However, due to the stubbornness of the Empire's leadership, all eager for a martial solution, Gadra's advice was ignored. Sighing, Gadra confessed that before the meeting, he had learned about Adelman's presence in the Monster Federation. Realizing the futility of his actions, Gadra now opposed the war. He shared with Rimuru all he knew, the Empire's modernization, the military leadership's thoughts, and Yuki's plan for a coup, and so on. Concluding his narrative with a sense of ease, Gadra revealed that, knowing Adelman was safe, he no longer had any emotional ties to the Eastern Empire. He expressed a desire to join Rimuru, serving the Monster Federation. Rimuru pondered this, realizing it wasn't ideal to welcome someone who openly admitted to a lack of loyalty. However, Rimura considered using Gadra's esteemed status in the Empire to prevent war, although he knew that it was almost impossible to influence a national will through personal desires. Yet Rimura had another plan. If war was inevitable, Gadra could help redirect the Empire's troops into the Monster Federation's labyrinth. Known to be indestructible within Ramrus Labyrinth, even a heart-piercing blow would not be fatal, allowing revival after some time. Thus, luring the Empire's army into the labyrinth meant reducing the casualties to zero even facing a million soldiers. The bait was the labyrinth's unique graded slotted weapon and the resurrection bracelets. If Gadra presented these to the Empire's greedier high ranks, they wouldn't miss the lucrative opportunity. Confidently, Gadra accepted the mission, becoming a temporary guest in the Monster Federation. Meanwhile, Shinji and the two otherworldly beings, after exchanging intelligence with their superior Yuki, naturally settled in the Monster Federation, swearing an unbreakable oath of loyalty to Rimuru. Thus, Rimuru gained unexpected allies, and the labyrinth commotion came to a close. In the subsequent period, Rimuru commenced an investigation into the guardians of the labyrinth. Due to a detour to the Holy Empire Rubrios, the labyrinth had been managed by Ramaris and Veldora in Rimura's absence. With war imminent, understanding the labyrinth's actual combat strength was crucial. From previous battles, it was astonishingly evident that Albert alone had repelled Shinji's trio, far exceeding Rimura's expectations. Rimura learned that Adelman's pet, the undead dragon, had also undergone a qualitative leap in strength. Consequently, he inquired if Ramaris had conducted special training for the other floor guardians as well. However, even Rimuru was startled upon discovering the actual situation from Ramaris. As she explained, after special training by Veldora and Hinata, 
the underground labyrinth had evolved, giving birth to the formidable beings known as the Ten Guardians of the Underground Labyrinth. The Death Paladin Albert of the 70th Floor and the Floor Guardian White King Adelman already possessed strength rivaling an archdemon. Further down were the 79th Floor's Domain Guardian Insect Queen Apito and the 80th Floor's Domain Guardian Insect Kaiser Zijin. Originally insect monsters from the Jura Forest, they were on the brink of death when Remuras saved them, leading to their induction into the Monster Federation. Under Veldora and Hinata's direct training, they gained extraordinary power, with Zijin ranking among the forefront in the Monster Federation. It was said he even defeated the three primordial demon beauties. It's worth noting that Remuri used his own body cells to save Zijin leading Diablo to set a restriction for the demon subordinates not to attack cells of Lord Rimuru on Zijin's body. This significantly increased the difficulty for the three primordial demon beauties to win. Nonetheless, even without this, Zijin remained a pinnacle existence in the labyrinth world. Lastly was the 90th floor's guardian Kamara, a nine tails with the intrinsic skill beast domination and unification. She could transform her eight tails into different animal forms each surpassing A grade. Although not the strongest, she lived up to the reputation of a 90th floor guardian. Including them, the four dragon lords guarding floors 96 to 99, and Beretta overseeing all labyrinth affairs, constituted the labyrinth's strongest combat forces. After hearing Ramrus's statement, Rimura personally met each guardian, confirming their actual combat strength. The results naturally astonished Rimuru, even leading him to believe that as long as the battle occurred within the labyrinth, defeat was impossible. Shifting focus to the Eastern Empire, Gadra, following Remura's instructions, brought labyrinth treasures, slotted weapons, and resurrection bracelets back to the Empire. In a royal meeting, he publicly voiced his opposition to attacking the Jura Forest. Naturally, expressing such sentiments on the eve of war invited majority opposition. Some ridiculed Gadra as a coward, while others viewed it as defiance against Emperor Rudra's will. Regardless, Gadra was in a clear disadvantage. Gadra, earnest and persistent, couldn't comprehend why these people failed to grasp a fact. The Storm Dragon was one of the few true dragons in the world, an ultimate entity. Yet, he was met with relentless mockery. Kalgurio, the commander of the armored division, the largest division in the Eastern Empire's military, confidently claimed that, with scientific knowledge learned from another world, the empire's military might had increased manifold from the previous era. He viewed Master Gadra as a relic of the past, a backward magician who should gratefully accept Emperor Rudra's benevolence and retire in peace. Upon learning of the vast treasures within the labyrinth, Kalgurio advocated for attacking the Jura forest, aiming to conquer the labyrinth and seize its riches. His claims weren't unfounded the Empire's military truly entered a new era. His armored division alone boasted two million soldiers, with over a million readily deployable, equipped with modern weaponry like magitanks and airships. In his eyes, neither Veldora nor the demon lord posed any threat. Observing Gadra's situation with confidence, Kalgurio saw him assume an indignant demeanor. Of course, this was mere acting from Gadra. Now a member of the Monster Federation— Gadra couldn't care less about the Empire's future. Nonetheless, he wished his colleagues no misfortune and also remembered Emperor Rudra's kindness, hence his attempt to steer the meeting towards avoiding war. But considering the current circumstances, it was time for his second plan. Thus, he shifted his gaze to the silent Yuki, who, as if long-awaited, spoke up. Yuki supported Gadra's cautious stance, suggesting thorough investigation before waging war. To cross the Jura Forest, one must traverse Demon Lord Rimuru's domain. Based on Master Gadra's findings, Rimuru could potentially transport his entire city into the labyrinth, guarded by the storm dragon Veldora. If the army passed through the labyrinth to attack western countries, they risked attacks from behind. Hence, Yuki deemed it necessary to investigate the labyrinth. When Yuki seriously spoke up, the nobles in the hall began to buzz with conversation with most agreeing that an investigation was indeed necessary. However, Kalgurio's expression turned sour. He believed Yuki's little tricks were all aimed at gaining the right to investigate the labyrinth, 
then to seize its treasures for personal gain. As the hall gradually leaned towards letting Yuki handle the labyrinth investigation, an irate Kalburio stood up. After bowing to the emperor seated behind the curtains, he expressed his unwavering loyalty and readiness to face any danger for the emperor's peace of mind. Asserting his fearlessness towards the storm dragon, unlike Gadra or Yuki, Kalburio proclaimed he needed only a word from the emperor to accomplish the mission. Hearing this challenge, both the Magic Beast Division Commander Gradum and Composite Division Commander Yuki hastily volunteered for combat, plunging the scene into chaos. However, as everyone awaited the Emperor's response, a person stood up from behind the curtain, revealing a bewitching smile. It was the Empire's supreme leader, the Marshal. She demanded silence in the presence of Emperor Rudra. As the nation's strongest, known only to a select few, her statement immediately hushed the room, compelling everyone into a reverent bow. The marshal then asked Kalgurio to share his battle plan, given his confidence in the war. However, even the previously assertive Kalgurio seemed subdued by the marshal's aura. He did have a plan to defeat the Storm Dragon, involving the Empire's new technology to disrupt Storm Dragon Veldora's magicules, followed by a massive barrage from airships and a final assault by 2,000 magitanks. Yet, as he spoke, Kalgurio realized his strategy, relying on sheer numbers, was naive. The marshal shook her head, deeming Kalgurio incompetent. She clarified that the Empire didn't intend to annihilate Veldora, the naughty child, leaving everyone dumbfounded. Maintaining her composure, the marshal explained that if avoiding Veldora was the goal, the Empire had already missed its best chance 200 years ago when the storm dragon was sealed. Yet, the Empire made no move. She revealed the Empire awaited Veldora's revival for a perfect showdown, aiming to demonstrate the Emperor's might to the world. Thus, the Empire sought not Veldora's destruction, but domination, the true mark of victory. The hall fell silent, as if everyone's hearts were seized by fear and terror, even Gadra shuddered. Why was the Marshal so confident? Despite Gadra's insistence on the impossibility of mentally dominating Veldora, the marshal referred to Veldora as a naughty child, exuding a superiority that instilled unspeakable fear in Gadra. Gadra realized, to his horror, that the marshal's mental domination magic far exceeded his own. As Gadra stared towards the other side of the curtain, where a slender figure stood, she perceived not a human, but a monstrous being akin to a true dragon in human form. Gadra was right this time, the marshal is Velgrand, the scorched dragon. In the tense atmosphere, Yuki spoke up, proposing a battle plan. With the marshal's permission, a discussion ensued, culminating in a strategy. First, the armored division would split into three, the Magitank Corps and Flying Combat Corps to attack from Jura Forest towards Dwargan Armed Nation, cutting off Dwargan's support to the Monster Federation. The main force of the armored division would directly attack the Monster Federation. Second, the Composite Division led by Yuki, would strike at Dwargan Arm Nation, while the Magic Beast Division would launch a surprise attack on the Western nations via airships. Thus, the Empire's multi-front invasion plan was set. As the Imperial Decree of War was issued in the Emperor's name, the hall erupted in fervor, concluding the Imperial Council. Afterwards, Gadra, pondering the strength of the Monster Federation, realized the Empire was destined to lose. Following a conversation with Yuki, he decided to seek an audience with the Emperor before heading to the Monster Federation. Informed by the Emperor Rudra's guard that the Emperor awaited him, Gadra entered the corridor adorned with ever-blooming cherry blossoms, a symbol of the Empire's prosperity. Though beautiful, these flowers were poorly regarded by those from other worlds, who believed cherry blossoms' fleeting nature added to their beauty. As Gadra contemplated the eternal cherry blossoms, he summoned his trusted wand and approached a robust man under the tree, Tatsuya Kandu, head of the Imperial Intelligence Bureau, a mysterious otherworlder. Direct and to the point, Tatsuya declared he wouldn't allow Gadra to meet Emperor Rudra. Mirroring Gadra's movements, Tatsuya drew a black gleaming Nambu semi-automatic gun. Realizing Tatsuya's intent to kill him, Gadra sharply questioned him, yet Tatsuya remained unshaken. Suddenly, a sharp pain struck Gadra. In the midst of his loud questioning, he collapsed from a dagger thrust in his back, not a gunshot wound. 
A voice declared Gadda dangerous, a traitor unforgivable, an obstacle to the emperor's world unification plans. Recognizing the familiar voice, Gadda's consciousness faded, grappling with the reality of imminent death amidst the undying cherry blossoms. In his final gamble, he activated a precast spell, and his consciousness was severed. That's all for this video. In the next episode, we'll discuss Testarossa's final warning to the Empire's army and the official onset of war between the two nations. If you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, and subscribe. Your support fuels my continued efforts. See you in the next one.